Hey, Andrew, why don't you get the first panel up and I'll get the meeting started. I'll wait for Erin to get back to her seat. All right, good morning, everyone. This is the uh, Climate and Sustainability Committee. We uh, have several items on the agenda today. We don't have a quorum at this point, so I'll skip over roll call and the approval of the minutes, but just some, some quick housekeeping for those in the audience. We are going to defer item number four, which is the resolution and clarification of community solar rules. We're still kind of working through some uh, things there with that particular resolution. So that's gonna be deferred to a, for, to a future meeting, okay? Um, okay, so with that, let's go with item number three, which is a master plan for city lighting and enforcement to prevent copper thefts from lighting infrastructure. So uh, as everyone is aware, uh, the, the city council has been working with um, DPW on doing all possible to keep the lights on. And there are uh, different obstacles that continue to be in the way to ensure that the lights um, stay on. One of those issues happens to be with copper thefts. And so it's almost like we're playing this game of whack-a-mole where we'll go fix lights and then next thing we know, the, the copper stolen and once again, the light is out. And then that takes a certain amount of time to get the light back on, not to mention it takes uh, a lot of money to continue to, to repair our lights this way. What we have seen is that we're certainly not the only city that's dealing with an obstacle like this. This is something that's happening across the country, um, seeing in, um, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, seeing it in Los Angeles, um, seeing it in Las Vegas, seeing it, like I said, all across the country. And because of this, we are seeing other cities, which I believe we should do the same, come up with different alternatives to try to prevent copper thefts or even try to revise their infrastructure so that copper isn't part of their lighting infrastructure. So that means potentially switching over to solar, potentially switching over to materials like aluminum. And while aluminum doesn't necessarily last as long as copper, right now we're at the point where some of our lights aren't lasting at all because the, of the thefts. So the reason why I think it's important to have a master plan is we really haven't had an analysis of our, our light infrastructure, um, looking at our assets, and also potential you know, new options since roughly 2012. And so we're, we're long overdue to have a new master plan. And, um, and speaking with, with Shannon, you know, that certainly seems to be uh, something in line with what DPW would like to, to work on. So the council very much wants to partner with DPW to put together this master plan to make sure that you have the funding to go out and do an RFP, to do a third party analysis, to do a master plan so that we can realize, you know, what are the best options for the city and also what, what are the cost impacts as well? You know, what is it going to take to really, you know, put the dollars behind what our um, upgraded lighting system is going to look like? In the meantime, uh, a couple weeks ago now, maybe three weeks ago or so, I sent a letter to state police because I looked at what other cities were doing as far as enforcement to try to prevent these copper thefts. And other cities had formed specific law enforcement task forces to try to not only do additional patrolling around uh, some of the lighting infrastructure and in areas where there had been thefts, but also really trying to focus in on targeting who is purchasing illegally uh, stolen copper. So I sent a letter to state police, um, talked to Chief Kirkpatrick, and she said that, you know, that, that they had been talking on trying to figure out a path to deal with the enforcement piece around the lighting infrastructure. And that's why uh, we've got two great members of the New Orleans Police Department of the leadership team here um, to present on that as well. But Shannon, I'll go ahead and start with you. Um, introduce yourself and, and who's with you. And uh, we'll begin, and then we'll turn it over to Chief Gauthier. My name is Kristen Watson from Public Works. Shannon Blanks, Deputy Director, Public Works. Hans Ganthier, uh, New Orleans Police Department. Wayne DeLarge, New Orleans Police Department. All right. Good morning, Council President Moreno. Thank you for inviting us. Um, as you uh, just want to reiterate what you said, theft has been a huge problem through, for us throughout the city. Uh, I presented some pictures here on the second slide you can show. This is where someone has taken it. And that car, I believe, was on its way back to Mississippi. That's also our aluminum poles. 
They're even collecting our knockdowns before we can even get there, so they become pole replacements at that point. They're, they've knocked down um, a, granite poles and have attached something to the wiring on the inside of the granite poles to a truck and been able to pull the wire straight out of our lighting assets. Just yesterday, we had photographs of our uh, members of our unhoused community pulling the wiring out of the base of some of our lights and using it to power their personal equipment. So it's widespread and throughout the city. What we calculated yesterday is at least over 100 lights being out because of uh, theft and vandalism to our infrastructure. So adherence to state law um, requires a DOTD pr approval for uh, lane closures on the interstate. So we do have a few encumbrances that keep us from getting those replaced quickly, supply chain, and as quick as they go, as quick as they come down, it's not as quick to return them back on. So. How, what is the, usually the, the, the time frame from when um, a light goes down to, to the amount of time it takes to repair? That has unfortunate. Um, 20, I think 20 weeks just for a supply order, so wow. assuming that there's no supply chain issue. And then the approvals and getting them online is an additional eight weeks. So, I mean, anywhere... 30, 40 weeks out um, is average, wow. unfortunately. That's on our interstate system, so. Wow. Yeah. And then, let's see. We do, um, we did put forward a grant out of our ORS. They applied for a $25 million proposal from the U.S. Department of Transportation's RAISE program but we won't know if we will receive that allocation until later this year. It's supposed to, ex expected to find the results in the summer. But I do agree that, that um, it is important to have a comprehensive master plan in place with recommendations that will assist the city in bidding out its contracts moving forward. WCAO Joe Threat has also went ahead and decide, ushered in a um, task for us to and the innovation team to put together an RFQ mm -hmm. which will allow potential vendors to introduce new technology to the city and see what's out there and then we with the master plan we can kind of marry the two endeavors and see what it looks like and the best options for us. That's great and actually um, I can have my team send to you what Los Angeles put out because they did something similar. It was like a request for, for innovation mm -hmm. um, solutions uh, on their lighting issues. And I can send what they put out because it may be helpful as you're drafting yours. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So I think that what you mentioned is really important to talk about, that when uh, we have one light go down, uh, it roughly takes, I mean, if we're talking about 30 weeks, it roughly takes then seven months, seven months to repair. Yeah. And, and assuming what is, that it was, assuming it goes smooth, because we don't stockpile everything. So that that's a tremendous amount of time. And what's the what's the is there like an average cost? Um, I'd have to take a look at that. I other costs that I have seen is usually around three hundred thousand uh, dollars annually for per thousand lights. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. Yep. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chief, Captain uh, Large, either one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. First, thank you for having us here. Uh, on behalf of Chief uh, Kirkpatrick, I'd like to speak on some of the issues that you have. And obviously, copper theft is really for financial gain, and that is where law enforcement can come in and really target that aspect of it. So we are collab going to collaborate and are planning to talk to the state police and see what they can bring us for assets. Obviously, I wish we could patrol everywhere on the interstate, but that we just don't have that capability yet. So what we're going to do is really, really use our data analytics, where this is happening, where we need to put officers or state troopers, and also trigger our investigative uh, <coughs> capacity as well, so that we can now focus in on, you mentioned it briefly, where this is being sold and where our detectives can really pin down. We have some ideas within the city 
where that may be occurring, and we have had cases on them before. But we will probably amp that up to see where it's really being sold at, because that is where we're going to be able to really make a difference. So um, I know New Orleans East is affected, and um, there's quite a bit of uh, lights that are out. Um, and I had him, uh, Captain DeLarge, do actual uh, ride through, and he can tell you where it was affected, some of these lightings are. So I'll turn it over to him at this point. Captain? Greetings. Um, so we conducted an audit for the most part where we rode the interstate uh, traveling eastbound from uh, Dowman, per se, all the way to St. Tammany and St. Bernard Parish, which is where the 7th District ends. Um, while traveling eastbound from the base of the high rise, we noticed several lights were out. However, once you enter the Morrison Curve, that area was well lit. From the Morrison Curve to the Crowder exit, approximately eight lights were out. That represents roughly 33% of the lighting between that one mile stretch between Morrison and Crowder. The same exists from Crowder to Reed, roughly eight lights again, representing one third or 33% of the total lighting. And then when we traveled from Reed to Bullard, we noticed, we noticed a smaller, excuse me, a smaller percentage was out, roughly 25% from Reed to Bullard. From Bullard, once you get to Shellmet, the Shellmet exit or the Little Woods exit, and then you have the option to travel down uh, 510, the lighting became poor, extremely poor. On 510, as you travel in New Orleans East, to Shellmet, there was no lighting. There were no lightings, no lights. Once you pass that Shellmet exit and that Little Woods exit, no lights. So that uh, that pretty much is the lighting report. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when I reached out to the state police, um, knowing that NOPD does not have really the resources to just be you know patrolling, uh, looking for potential copper thieves. Um, I think that this would be an, an, an excellent way that Troop NOLA could help the city of New Orleans through doing these additional patrols. Um, I, I, I agree with you, Chief, like we just don't have the manpower to be able to do this. But now if Troop NOLA is coming in, well, this would be something beneficial that they certainly could do. I want to speak for them, Councilwoman, yeah. but uh, I, I would, it would depend on the number of people they're bringing down. That's still, that's still being worked out. So. Yes, if they could give us the assistance for that, we would accept it gladly. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Do you have any questions, council member? No, I mean, I, we, we've been talking about, and I see DPWs here, we've been talking about this issue of lighting for a long time, I think since my term began three years ago. And I know that um, we have emergency lighting contracts in place to, uh, to repair lighting. Have, are there permanent contracts in place now? We have an O&M contract in place. I don't have an emergency that I know of. Okay, so I, so I thought per district that there were contracts that were in place to repair lighting. Is that not the case? No, ma'am. Okay, we that, have, that, we that have an operations and maintenance. We had some contracts go up to procurement to, to be responsive in event of an adverse weather event. So there, there are currently no contracts in place to, re, to do regular maintenance on lighting around the city? We do. Have a, we have an operations and maintenance contract that replaces citywide. There's not individual contracts per district in place. And how are you prioritizing lighting? I asked this question at a last, uh, last meeting earlier. Yes. Um, we are doing interstates, of course, are going to be first. Then we also do... Uh, heavily pedestrian areas by neighborhood, so schools, universities, high schools, um, junior highs, we do colleges, um, what was the other one? Uh, um, bus routes to make sure that there's lighting on the bus routes and parks and around parks, so we will look at it from a safety aspect from the per neighborhood 
to try to light an area instead of just one-off spurs that will infect more people. And then we begin to do our neighborhoods. We have four crews that do patrolling every day. And I believe there's like several different crews that work for All Star that go out and do different parts of the repair depending on what the problem is. So, so at the last meeting, it was with the DA and I think DPW was present. I asked specifically about coordinating lighting implementation and fixing lights where there are high crime areas. Yes. Are you guys doing that at all? Yes, we're with the No Dice program. We meet with the DA on that as well. And so are you prioritizing, and that's my question to you, are yes. you prioritizing those areas where we know that there's crime rather than just willy-nilly prioritizing yes. high, you know, high schools or bus routes or whatever? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I can tell you that there's lighting out um, all over District B, um, especially in areas where I know that there's high crime. So I will get you those areas. I know that Matthew from my office keeps the list and we will share that list with you. Um, and of course, I would want you to keep working with the DA on high crime areas. Okay, I'll, I will look forward to the list. Thank you. Okay. And um, Council Member Harris, Captain DeLarge talked about, um, he did an assessment of some of the areas around New Orleans East um, that don't have lighting. I think, um, Chief, it would be great if we could have the other captains of the and, other uh, districts. Yeah, I didn't mention the Councilwoman's district, but that captain, Captain Gillard, actually did the same analysis, and I believe he came up with like 46 some odd lights out. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Erica, Officer Erica Williams shared that list with us, which we then shared with DPW. So y'all should have that. And I'm hoping that you prioritize those lights as far as you can without to the detriment of other districts. But we know that there are lights out in Central City um, in areas where there are high crime areas. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? All right, we're good. Uh, any public comment, Aaron? No public comment. All right. Well, thank you all so much for your presentation. Um, looking forward to working with you all as you put out the RFQ for innovation and, of course, as we move forward with the master plan for lighting. All right. Appreciate okay. it. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. thank you all. All right. So that brings us to, real quick, while I have a quorum, let me do the approval of the minutes for the January 3rd meeting. It's been moved by Councilmember Morrell, seconded by Councilmember Harris. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aaron, the minutes are approved. Um, all right, so that takes us to item number five, which is the... Council member, yep. do you want to do the motion associated with the lighting project? Sure. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll move on the motion. Seconded by Council member Harris. All in favor? Aye. Three yeas. So we have time to put that on the consent then? All right, we'll put it on consent. All right, so that brings us to item number five which is the resolution on renewable and clean portfolio standards. Erin, I think you're gonna hit this one. Yes, ma'am. This resolution simply states that Entergy's compliance report for the year 2022 related to the renewable and clean portfolio standard showed that Entergy is in compliance with the standard set forth by the council in docket UD 1901. Any questions, seeing none from the dais, any public comment? I don't have any cards. All right, got it. I'll make a motion. Seconded by Councilmember Morrell. All in favor, three yeas, no nays. And then that takes us to the last one, which is resolution on the battery storage pilot program. And this is actually a, a really exciting program. Um, this uh, deals with uh, residential properties that have had batteries on their, their properties and kind of the, the beneficial impacts that this has uh, not only brought to these specific residents, but also the potential impact that this has on adding this battery uh, storage, putting it back into the grid as well. Um, I don't know if anyone from Entergy wants to make any comments on this. Nope, everybody good? Aaron, do you have anything else to add on this? All right, um, so this is approval of phase two of the Entergy New Orleans Battery Energy Storage System and Solar Pilot Program. If I can get a motion, it's been moved by Councilmember Morrell, seconded by Councilmember Harris. All in favor? Three yeas, no nays. And that right there completes our agenda. Motion to adjourn by Councilmember Harris, seconded by Councilmember Morrell. Three yeas, no nays. Thank you all. Yeah.